All right, welcome to the In Depth Podcast, Black Male Achievement Podcast. Uh, today we have Mr. Damon Cobble. Uh, Damon Cobble is of the Minority Mental Health Project, and he's also a mental health practitioner at Western Middle School. The Minority Mental Health Project is a threefold initiative aimed to address affordability, cultural responsibility, and accessibility by increasing awareness, culturally responsive interventions, and preventative measures. So, Damon. If you could uh, just give tell us a little bit about yourself and uh, what led you to create the Minority Mental Health Project. And I do want to start out by saying that I have attended one of your events. It was very powerful. It made me uh, become very introspective. It made me uh, buy the book by Jason Wilson, Cry Like a Man. Uh, a lot of stuff that I just thought was normal for being a black man. Uh, by coming to the event, I realized it shouldn't be normalized. So just tell us a little bit about uh, your journey to being where you are today and what uh, was the thought process behind creating the Minority Mental Health Project? Hey, I appreciate Mr. Van for allowing me to, you know, to engage in this platform. It's such a very important conversation. Uh, kind of the backstory of Damon Cobble is I'm from Louisville. I grew up in um, the projects, uh, Lane Home, Southwick, um, back in the 70s and 80s, um, single family household. You know, my mother uh, was, um, a victim of domestic violence. My mother, uh, we struggled uh, socioeconomically um, in, in some of those, those factors, along with my academic journey of uh, not being able to read or write coming out of high school, uh, were factors that motivated me to address some personal issues uh, that I felt like were barriers to me being um, a better father, a better son, and a better role model. And so those are some of the factors that's kind of kind of shaped me and kind of led me to uh, creating the Minority Mental Health Project. And more specifically, the Minority Mental Health Project was created to address the reach, the gaps in the research when it comes to underserved communities uh, receiving therapeutic services. And there are many systemic barriers uh, to African Americans receiving therapeutic services. But more specifically, what I identified. Uh, were, were accessibility, affordability, and culture responsibility. There's not too many of us representing our culture within the world of psychology. Uh, from my last, from my knowledge, uh, African American men make up, I believe, one percent of the psychology workforce in the U.S. I believe minorities make up four percent of the psychology workforce in the U.S. And so once. You know, I was able to overcome my own personal obstacles and struggles. I kind of felt like I had an obligation to at least bring back some of these skill sets that I've been so blessed uh, to have and and being able to overcome to bring back to the community and create an organization that will address these gaps in the research to um, with our underserved communities. So you being a black man and you going through the things that you went through growing up, we talk about domestic violence, uh, struggling financially. Uh, was it hard for you to open up to address like what was the process like to open up to address your own mental health? Um, I don't want I don't know the right term. I don't want to say issues, but your own mental health challenges. Um, how what was that process like for you? Well, it's, it's very challenging, you know, um, being, you know, having the fortitude of trying to find that internal strength to really, you know, face your own demons um, was a very big challenge for me personally. Um, but I had to because I have children. I have three beautiful children. And, you know, I wanted to uh, set a better example for them or be a better father, be a better uh, role model for them. Now, um, I'm not perfect. You know, I continue to make mistakes for doing those processes. I decided to seek out the help uh, myself so I can become a better role model, not only to my children, but to the uh, young black men in the, in the West End or the underserved communities who may be struggling to open up about uh, their internal issues. Uh, a lot of people, like the past couple of years, it's a lot of people that are starting to address mental health in the black community. And a, lot, a thing I hear all the time is black, uh, our mental health is taboo in the black community. Is that a true statement? And if, or is it a myth? And if it is true, why why do you believe it's true? Well, I, I think, uh, is it a, mm, it's, you know, you gotta look at the historical context. So even though there's much research on risk factors, there's much, much research on at-risk behaviors, there's much research on mental, um, uh, 
maladies, you know, of all kinds within the underserved communities, but experts have not given enough time and attention to the issues of the mental health, mental health issues within the black community and the stigma often, uh, often experienced by blacks who, not, who even acknowledge having the mental health issues. So yes, I believe there is a stigma. There's a lot of myths, uh, a lot of um, uh, myths that need to be dispelled, but I think more attention from the uh, science community, from the researchers needs to be given more to the specific issue when it comes to at-risk behaviors, risk factors uh, with black community. With you uh, working in a, a middle school, um, with the mental health challenges that you approach or that you see every day, what do you think are the most common uh, things that you see amongst black youth in particular, black males? Well, I think it's more so um, them conforming to the narrative that has been created for them. You know, not enough attention is focused on uh, reinforcing their competencies. They're, they're the positive skill sets that they do have. Um, I, I think, you know, the lack of father being in the home is a, is a definitely um, a barrier to the development of young black men. Uh, so I think there's, there's a lot of um, effects, a lot of factors that play a role in, in, into that. But most important, what I see, I see a lot of young black males uh, within the school system that are just conforming to not only the narrative, but China, they're seeking out that love and attention that should be um, provided within the household that they reside. Okay, we just had Lyndon Pryor from uh, the Louisville Urban League to join us, so he may pop in with a question at some point. Uh, of course, we have a lot of stuff that's going on in the media and in the world today, uh, and a lot of, of our way of taking that stuff in is from social media, you know, me, especially for this past week, before I go to sleep, it's hard to put my phone down because it's like I'm still scrolling, trying to see what's going on in Louisville around the world. So um, what do you think the effects of black, the social media that is having on black youth today? Uh, social media can have uh, um, many effects on our, on our children, adolescents specifically. It can have, uh, it can affect their self view and their interpersonal relationships through social, social comparison and negative interaction, uh, including cyberbullying. And moreover, social media content often involves, um, involves normalization and, and even promotion of self-harm and su suicidality among youth. So high proportions of youth uh, are engaged in very heavily in smartphone usage and multimedia multitasking with, uh, res uh, re with is causing adverse effects such as sleep deprivation, uh, negative effects on their cogn cognitive control, uh, and also their academic performance and social um, emotional functioning. So, as a if, if there was a parent, uh, what kind of advice do you give to us parents who have kids that like to scroll social media? Because I saw like an article saying how social media is contributing to depression a lot in young people because they're comparing their lives, and I think it's adults too, uh, comparing their lives to what they what they see in mm -hmm. others. So, uh, do you believe parents shouldn't allow social media before a certain age? Uh, do you think there's a certain time limit? Like, what what kind of advice would you give the parents on uh, monitoring their children's social media intake? Well, not only as parents, but also also as as clinicians, as a professional clinician, we you know we we should we can work collaboratively, you know, with the youth and their families uh, using open non non judgmental, uh, developmental appropriate approaches uh, to reduce the potential harms uh, of social media and smartphone smartphone usage. Uh, including education and practical problem solving. There is a need for also more public awareness, which I know um, the JCPS is doing a great job of this. There's more need of more public awareness and social policy initiatives that promote nurturing and also nurturing at home and in school environments. And, the, and, and, and these, these behaviors, these relational behaviors, you know, of course, they foster resilience in our youth to navigate the challenges that they're facing every day. Oh. One of the things, you know, you have some people, a lot of people are protesting at this time uh, for black lives. Uh, we've seen time and time again over the years um, of black lives being taken uh, on cell phone footage. And we see it constantly over and over and over online. I, um, 
Yeah. Like Mike said, that we look, we watch it like murder porn. It's, we see it all the yeah. time, and we just—it's like we can't put our phone down. Uh, yeah. So, what are the effects do you think that seeing that not only of our youth but just people in general of seeing people that look like them, their lives taken by the people that are supposed to protect them? Man, that's um, man, that's a good question, man. Uh, it, it's it's hard, you know. I've been down, I've been engaged in the protests uh, quite a few uh, days, and and let me tell you, there are some definitely, and more to be more specific, uh, let's look at police brutality, right? Um, there are some correlations. Research has found some correlations or intersecting pathways. Uh, when it comes to between police brutality and the poor health outcomes of blacks. Uh, one is uh, the fatal injury. It increases the, the population um, specific mortality rate, uh, adverse uh, psychological responses. It increases uh, uh, more morbidity uh, and also racist public re the racist public reaction can cause distress. And not only that, you know, you have uh, the arrest, incarceration, and other legal, medical, and also even funeral bills that are associated with those violent behaviors, you know, they cause financial strain on our families. And so, and lastly, you know, you got to also take into consideration the, the oppressive uh, structures that cause systemic disempowerment as well. Yeah, one of the big things that, uh, and I hear people, like I heard a guy on the radio yesterday, he's a white guy, and he was talking about, if you look at stats, stats matter, if you look at the numbers, uh, white people are killed by police as well. And mm -hmm. the fact that, that, that to me, it's diminished what our challenges are when we uh, interact with law enforcement, of course, not our law enforcement, but with a lot of law enforcement, it feels like it's being diminished. And it's like, well, we had the same struggle. But the thing is, if you were to ask, you know, 10 black guys on the street and 10 white guys on the street, the the eye test will show you that we don't have the same the same struggle because me and all my friends have been harassed by law enforcement on multiple occasions, and it's not the same uh, for a lot of white America. And I think that this right here is um, this situation is bringing attention to that, and people are saying like, I I just literally did not know that that's what y'all were going through. And uh, I my my opinion is that a lot of this is on public education system, uh, JCPS along with other school districts. We're not doing enough to teach the true history of Black America and what what challenges we've had with law enforcement and policy in general over the years. So I think that that's just something that we have to do a better job of educating, not just black children, we have to educate all children so that everyone is aware of the challenges and struggles that we face. Uh, one of the things that I, uh, I was very, very interested in when I came to the event of yours that I came to was the idea behind vicarious trauma. And uh, so if you could explain vicarious trauma, what it is, so then we could talk about that a little bit. Um, vicarious trauma and how black people experience it. A vicarious trauma pretty much, it kind of goes as interchangeable with also the term secondary trauma. And so those terms are interchangeable and are frequently used uh, interchangeably to refer to the indirect trauma uh, that can occur when someone is exposed uh, to a difficult or, or disturbing uh, image or story of um, secondhand, right? So whether you call it a secondary trauma or vicarious trauma, what we are referring to as clinicians is um, the impact of the the impact of indirect exposure to that that experience, to that difficult, disturbing, or traumatic image image and stories of the suffering of others. So over time, the repeated exposure to difficult content um, can definitely uh, cause a generational uh, trauma, historic trauma, which is an example of intergenerational trauma. Uh, and so you gotta look at the history, not only uh, within systemically within our own city, within our own state, but you gotta look at the history of the United States of our country. And, and, and trauma started, you know, the, the physical aggression started with them, not us. And so it is ingrained in the fabric of our of our country. You know, so we have been experiencing this trauma, vicarious trauma, secondary trauma, even direct trauma for generations. You know, so I find it impossible for any institution or anyone to address trauma individually uh, without addressing the system that is reinforcing that 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 trauma. For an example, it is impossible for a parent 
who is not regulated, you know, to help regulate their child when they're not regulated themselves. You know, so if the system is dysregulated, it's definitely gonna um, have a generational historic context on the black family like it already has. So systemically, we need to look at the systems, you know, in terms of um, a, a equality and, and, and regulating the systems through policy in order for us to be regulated as a people individually and as a family. Yeah, and uh, I just said that our, our experiences are real. You know, when we yeah. see constantly online, black people being beaten or a shot for for just for being black you know or reaching for their license but somebody assumes that they're reaching for a gun when you see that on tv you can't help but when you see those blue lights flash behind you to feel anxious feel anxiety you know i literally ride down the street and i'm thinking if i get pulled over the way i'm going to handle it you know i don't keep my license registration in my glove compartment like some people do because I'm I'm cognizant that there's people who look like me who when they do that it's assumed that they reach for something other than their license and registration. Uh, I'll never forget being at the event that I attended with you. Uh, the guy asked about vicarious trauma because we had a anyone listen to this from outside of Louisville we had an event in Louisville of a man being shot and killed in a Kroger, a local Kroger. And the, the guy asked, when I walk in Kroger now and I'm nervous every time I go, is that a form of vicarious trauma? And the panel told him yes. Uh, and the thing that also was alarming to me, that the event that you had was at a church. And when I went, when we were at the church, uh, it was an event that everybody knew was for the Minority Mental Health Project. So people knew that it was going to be black people there. Uh, it was nighttime and it was a church with just all black people there. And I kept thinking, I, I looked at the exits and the entrances to the church and I was thinking, if somebody comes in here and sh tries to shoot up the church, what I'm going to do, what, and this is before the event even started, before I even knew anything that the panel was going to talk about. I was thinking about how I was going to respond. And I remember thinking, if I, if I do have to uh, fight somebody that I'm glad I'm with people who we are fighting for the same cause. Uh, but th those things that we've seen, and of course that's rooted out of a church being shot up in whether it's North Carolina or South Carolina, it's stuff that we've seen before. And I feel the same thing when I go to the movie theater, you know, mm -hmm. thinking of somebody coming in and shooting up the movie theater. And I know these are those things in particular aren't necessarily only black people's struggles, but it's definitely a struggle that we do have. So it's definitely a real, uh, real thing for us. Um, and Just, if I can chime in, if I can chime in on that, and, and this is very important, and, and I can't put enough emphasis on this, you know, and I'm sure you know this, and Mr. Pryor knows this, but our country has a history of subjecting Blacks to violent trauma experiences, you know, so until, you know, our country decides to make a change, you know, we are going to continue to be subjected to these micro and macroaggressions, rather be through policy or rather be directly. And so, and that is one of the issues that a lot of clinicians struggle with when treating black families. They fail to take in the historical context. Mm -hmm. They fail to take in consideration the generational processing, the intergenerational trauma that is trickled down from generation to generation, maladaptive coping skills. They fail to take that into context behind closed doors. And this is one of the reasons why the Minority Mental Health Project exists. We want to push that. We want to challenge not only clinicians individually, but organizations, you know, and look at policy. We have to start looking at this in the in the greater context and stop treating our families uh, by putting a band-aid over what you see ex the external behaviors without digging deep and getting context and even treating that family from a contextual uh, respect, uh, standpoint. Can you tell us what that malad is it maladaptive coping coping skills? Can you tell us what that is? Yeah, for an example, let me give you an example. Like you have a baby, and this may be a bad example, but I'm saying it anyway. If you have a baby that's born on crack, if the mother was on crack and the baby is born a crack baby, right? So that baby is born, you know, on crack, and so that baby is going to have withdrawals or whatever. So that baby is going to have some maladaptive, some unhealthy coping skills as this baby is dealing with stress. From, from from birth. So that baby's gonna have to be treated as they get older because they were born born on crack. And it's also been proven through the human hormone, of uh, course, so that those maladaptive coping skills, rather be anxiety, can be triggered down through the DNA. And so if you have a mother 
who suffers from high anxiety, you know, who, who's never been treated. That is, it, science has proven that it can be trickled down through the genetics. And so your, the, 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 the child can, can have those maladaptive coping skills because the mother didn't address them at an older age. So now it's trickled down through the, uh, through the DNA. And then so that's how the intergenerational trauma continues to trickle down from generation to generation. Yeah, and that's interesting because I was reading some research behind that. I didn't know that that was a phrase, but I was reading some research behind that. And they talked about how a lot of times things in a normal family can follow that family for three to four generations after. So like if a man has anxiety or uh, whatever um, challenge he may have, it can follow for three to four generations. But the thing about uh, slavery, the since it lasted for hundreds of years, they believe in black families, it can it can travel further than three to four generations because it was so embedded in the DNA of a lot of people. So a lot of the people that we're seeing now, like when, when people say that all these young black boys have these behavioral disorders or uh, these issues that they believe are challenging, a lot of this stuff is stuff that has been passed down for generation to generation. And so what does... What does that look like? And I'm just off the top of my head. It may be that black people were were forced to work from sun up to sundown, or even maybe past sundown to do work. So maybe that's part of the reason why bl- black boys don't like to sit in a classroom. They like hands-on learning because they've never been throughout history. We weren't, we weren't allowed to sit in a house in the air conditioning and just sit down and stay calm. Our family members and, and generations ago, they worked all day long. So it's hard for us to sit down and just listen to uh, um, a lesson. So, um, of course, that challenge is, needs to be on teachers to figure out how to channel that behavior into a behavior that can be productive. But that's just part of the system that we're up against. Uh, so uh, just to end us up, can you just let us know like any kind of advice you may have to parents uh, for how they can take the mental health of their children um, and you themselves as well, if you want to get that, but definitely for the students, for parents that may have students in JCPS. Uh, yeah, there um some advice to parents in terms of when they're trying to protect their child's mental health, you know, talk to them, read, read, read to them, help them to understand, um, understand basic words, spend time cuddling with them, some of those Maslow, some of those basic needs, Maslow, Maslow needs, um, holding your baby, play with them, encourage a child to take part um, and, and pretend play um, and, and let your, let them make choices, let them make mistakes, encourage your child, um, talk to the school age child about friends, understand who their circle is, uh, just kind of normalize every day these conversations and and really what you're doing you're checking in on them but you're also reinforcing their competencies giving them some autonomy to to go through life you know while also being there available to catch them as if they fall you know so talk to your child about respecting others encouraging them to talk about possible consequences before their action before their actions stop you know stop and think so just generalize normalizing um, these conversations, you know, can definitely help protect a uh, child's mental health as they go through life stages of development. Let me ask you this. Uh, as a future father of boys, I see sometimes with, um, and our families in particular, uh, boys are looked at as weak if they cry. We, mm-hmm. uh, uh, we contribute crying and showing emotion to weakness. Uh, can you talk, can, can you say anything about the possible dangers in that? Yeah, what you're speaking of is the masculine role norm. And I, I grew up, you know, in, in an environment that really reinforced that boys don't cry. You know, boys are tough. You know, don't be a sissy. Don't be a wimp. And But what that does, that teaches us to internalize and suppress almost our deepest feelings, right? And mm-hmm. so when we are angry or when we are upset or we are mad because we're taught that boys are supposed to be tough and to hold hold himself up to a certain standard, you know, I use a balloon analogy. You know, our immune system is only designed to fight off one stress at a time, right? Mm. Just imagine if you're dealing with a common cold or a flu, your immune system is doing everything it can to get rid of that sickness, you know, through through bond regurgitating, through sweat, through fever, you know, Mm. through other means. Your body, your immune system is doing everything it can to get that sickness out of you, right? Right. So compound that with the, compound that with the socioeconomic inequalities. Compound that 
with a teacher who doesn't understand my my living conditions. You know, I'm worried about feeding my siblings when I get and go home. Compound that with the gang balance. Compound that with domestic balance. Our, we are overwhelming our immune system. You know, we don't have the skill set, Our specific, specifically our younger generation, they don't have the skill set to navigate all these adverse challenges. And that's where school counseling comes into play. That's where uh, open, having open dialogue with your children comes into play, giving them that outlet to ex externalize their true feelings. We may not agree with them, but we can validate their feelings. So giving them that out, you know, and, and giving them a safety, safe net to talk to would definitely help regulate and help them to mitigate through these life challenges. Um, I, I don't know if you know the stats on top of your head, but I know that there's been a large increase in suicide amongst black youth in the past couple of years. Uh, do you know the, the stats or anything behind that? No, I don't know the specific data, but I know it has definitely increased over the past four years, specifically among black males. Mm -hmm. And so that the suicide ideation, and I think it goes back to the conversation we just we just spoke of, right. and just not being able to uh, mitigate all of these life challenges through, you know, through life, you know, in terms of being able to address it. Plus, their brains are not really fully developed. And so what's happening is they created these pathways in their brains that when where they are normalizing these negative behaviors or these unsafe behaviors so these behaviors become normal to them and so what we have to do is create some more healthy pathways in their brains while their brain is still developing and teach giving them the skills set and the tools so they can navigate these life challenges and that's by having an open conversation a very honest conversation you know with what we're faced with as a culture and as, as black people and I see, I think a lot of what you're saying, and correct me if I'm wrong, it just sounds like a lot of this is just communicating and allowing our child to communicate and talk to, like, express their feelings, which is something that, uh, I, I don't know about white men, but I know as black men, a lot of us, we don't want to communicate, we don't want to open up, we don't want to share our true feelings. A lot of that comes from, like you said, when we were younger, we were pretty much taught and embedded that you shouldn't, you shouldn't. Uh, it's a sign of weakness to talk about the challenges that we're going through. And, um, you know, I don't know if it, I'm sure that when we, if we trace it all the way back, I'm sure a lot of that has to do with slavery as well, because we had to wake up and go to work and it could, you couldn't, um, it didn't matter what was going on. You had to work no matter what you were feeling on the inside. So uh, I know a lot of people think that black people always bring up slavery and uh, that, that's years ago, y'all should get over it. But I really think from a scientific standpoint, from the stuff you're saying and the research you're saying, a lot of this stuff is still having effects on our our, our generation and our, our families. So uh, I appreciate you joining me today. Can you tell us, tell people in Louisville, like if they wanted to get in touch or support the Minority Mental Health Project or to find out any information from you guys, how they can go about doing that? Uh, yes, the Minority Mental Health Project will be launching our uh, first infomercial actually Monday. And so if they want to volunteer, if they want to donate, or, you know, if, if they want to be a part of this initiative, they can go to www.mmhplou.com and, and they can uh, leave a message uh, expressing their interest. Uh, so look forward to um, us, our delivery of service to start next week in terms of serving the community. And let me share this with you too, man. This is an organization and I really didn't realize how unique this, this organization is. Um, you know, this it's a challenge, you know, um, trying to put something like this together. It's been a lot of barriers, a lot of challenges, mm -hmm. but you know, I have faith and it has really come together um, in terms of our partners, in terms of uh, the, the community cry for the need. And so we're an all black organization. We are all black board. We have all black therapists. We have black case managers. So, and then only that, we have a research component that is ran by an African-American male from the University of Louisville Diversity and Inclusion Department. So we're gonna be running pilots that we're, where we're gonna measure this and look at the effectiveness of the services that we're gonna that we're gonna be providing over the next year. So we're only not gonna just be, we're not just a, a ride-by organization. We, we're looking at sustainability, we're looking at long-term, we're looking at really addressing these gaps when it comes to the underserved and the black community uh, receiving therapeutic services. We want to remove those barriers out of the way. Well, I believe in you, man. That's the reason I want to have you on because uh, I didn't, the only reason I showed up at that event that you had was because of the title. It was called What's Killing Black Men? And I didn't know any, I didn't even know what I was walking into, 
but uh, it was powerful. And uh, one last thing, you, for, I didn't know that I had things that I needed to address or I needed to work out until I came to the event. What if there's people out there that feel because I felt like every everything that I did feel was normal. All black men feel it. So what's the point? You know, like this is just part of our struggle. If there's somebody out there listening that, that's thinking like, uh, I feel normal. I don't think I need any kind of therapy therapy or any kind. I don't need to talk to anybody. What would you say to somebody that may feel like they feel OK on the inside? Why is it important to still go talk to a mental health professional, I guess, to make sure? Maybe it's kind of like getting a tune up when you take your car for a tune up. Why do you think it's still important for people to uh, seek out mental health? That's OK, well, first of all, I think it's important that we dispel um, dispel this myth or whatever, you, uh, this untruth when it comes to receiving therapeutic services. You know, even growing up as a young uh, black uh, male in the Western of Louisville, I've always understood that receiving therapeutic services meant that I get dropped off, right? And I have to see whoever they assign me to. So right. we need to educate our community, educate our families that they have a right to choose who they want to talk to. They don't have to settle for any specific therapist that is just thrown at them. So mm -hmm. being engaged in the process is vitally important, uh, especially with our black males, because they think that we are just going to report them. We're just going to turn them in. It's like we're a part of that 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 system that's trying to that's out to get them. So it's a trust issue. You know, you got to think about it, over 85 percent of, of the um, therapists in the United States are Caucasian. And so, of course, that's going to be a, a trust. So 30, 35 percent. No, over 84 percent, over 84, over 84 percent of the psychology workforce in the U.S. are Caucasian. And so we don't have anybody in the field that looks like us. We don't have anybody in this field. We have some, but it's not many of us. And right. so and that's one of the reasons why we, we implement this project. We wanted to galvanize not only, you know, faith entities, but non-faith entities. Uh, we want to expose all of our black therapists because we have some great african-american clinicians in this community and so but the more we come together the bigger impact we're going to have on the masses and so i'll say to any black male anyone who who has who's hesitating to receive therapeutic services be engaged ask questions you know ask questions to your psychologist like you should be asking questions to, with your medical doctor what is the difference between how a black person metabolizes medicine compared to a Caucasian person. If your doctor, or if they don't know that, I think that's a bigger discussion, right? And so if you're not engaged in that process, you're just going to accept whatever they tell you, right? And if you don't do the research behind that medication, you're just going to accept whatever they tell you. So you have to be engaged in the process, in the process ask questions. And, and therapy is pretty much relational. Just like you and I, we're talking right now. This is therapeutic for me. Because right. I feel like this is this is helping me get the message out, which really helps me stay regulated because I know the need is desperately out as needed, right? Mm -hmm. And so therapy is just a relation, a relationship. You know, get in there and engage. And if you don't like the fit, if you don't think it's a good fit, if you don't think that they're taking, you know, your whole family system in context, that they're not understanding you as a culture, then you have the right to choose and you have a right to to discontinue services as well. Yeah. Well, I think that uh, this is important, um, not only because it's important anyway, but it's important, especially because of what's going on right now in the world. Uh, there's a lot of stuff that we're seeing on uh, social media and seeing on the news. And then you compound that with your uh, white friends or people asking you questions because they're either they're skeptical of what's going on or they're just so unsure. So you feel like you have to be able to help to spread this message of our struggle because you know one of the things I think is right now is the in my lifetime it feels like this is the most attention we've ever had from white people to black issues uh, and I don't think that this is the t I don't think we can afford to let this slip away because even though uh, black people can do a lot I don't think we can change the entire system by ourselves we need allies we need friends we need family of other races and ethnicities to assist us with the, with approaching this uh, idea of white supremacy and systemic racism. Um, 
a lot of this stuff is is new terminology for a lot of people because they've just never heard heard about it. And I think it's important for you because the reason I asked you that last question is there's a stigma. Like if you tell somebody maybe you should go see a therapist, first thing a lot of black people will say is, "Man, I'm not crazy." They think that therapy is for crazy people. So uh, I just think it's important to get this message out. So I appreciate you joining me and to just kind of give help push this message to. Um, black men, black people, and even others who uh, want to support us and want to understand uh, our plight a little bit better. So I appreciate you joining joining me today. And uh, is there anything else that you want to plug for Minority Mental Health Project before we end it? No, just look for our information on social media. We're going to launch that Monday. Um, it's very powerful. And it kind of gives a, a great overview of what the Minority Mental Health is, is, is all about. So www.mmhplou.com. And let me say this too, man. I've only met knowing you for about a year. Have we known each other for about a year? And I'm, I'm hey, very. I don't think uh, it's been. That, I don't think it's been that long. Yeah, I'm very impressed with with how you use your your position and your platform, man. So kudos to you, uh, man. Keep doing what you're doing to to help the cause and use your platform to help help the community, man. I really appreciate. It. Well, I appreciate that, too. And uh, that's for anybody that doesn't listen to that today or this week. It's Monday, June 8th. He's saying that uh, the information will come out. And um, can you tell them if they want to find you on Facebook, what they type in? Uh, do you have an Instagram? Do you have Twitter? Just tell everybody how they can keep up with y'all. Yeah. Um, Facebook, I believe it's at MMHPKY. Uh, Twitter is MMHP. It's at MMHP, lowercase L-O-U. Okay. All right. Well, thank you, man. And uh, that's it. We'll wrap it up here. Thanks, everybody, for listening. All right. Thanks, man. Appreciate you, buddy. Mm.